lucky you've actually brought the alleged weapon into the court. Yes. It's quite a small one. I think it's too outrageous. No, not at all. I think it's very creative. Amy Sellers, you stand indicted and the charge is that you attempted to murder Valerie Sellers. The particulars being that on the 24th of June this year, you did attempt to drown the said Valerie Sellers at Fulchester Jubilee Park. To that charge, Amy Sellers, do you plead guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. The case you're about to see is a fictional one, but the procedure is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is made up of members of the general public who will actually decide the verdict. I call Clive Warren. Call Clive Warren. Will you take the book in your right hand and read aloud the words on the card? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You are Clive James Warren? Yes. And you live at 116 Bull Lane, Fulchester? Uh, no, I used to live there. I live in the Hall of Residence now. Yes, very well. Mr. Warren, where were you at approximately 2.20 p.m. on the afternoon of the 21st of June this year? On the boating lake at Fulchester Jubilee Park. I remember the time because I was due at practice at 3.50. And can you tell us what happened? Well, I was sailing towards shore when I saw this other boat with two women standing up and shouting. Did you hear what they were saying? I heard the younger one say, let me go, let go. That's all I heard. Then she was in the water. My lord, with your agreement and the agreement of the defence, I would now like this witness to place the occupants in the boat. What do you mean, Miss Flannery? You want the, the actual people to get into, into this thing here in court? My lord, yes. What have you to say to that, Mrs Sinclair? Oh, I have no objection, my lord, if my learned friend thinks that such a melodrama will assist the jury. Hmm. Barry Sellers, Nigel Holt, Valerie Sellers. Oh, all three of us? Yes, please. Warren, are these people the occupants of the boat? Yes. Tell us where each one was sitting. Well, him, he was at the stern. Would you get in the boat, please, Mr. Holt? Help me to get in it. As you were on that day, please. Go on, Mr. Warren. He was rowing. Mr. Sellers. And the two women were at the front. I know it's difficult, but we're trying to find out what happened. Would you both get into the boat, please? But come on, then. She's doing that on purpose. I'm the one should be terrified. She's more likely to do me than I ever was to touch her. My Lord, are these pyrotechnics necessary? With respect, the court could have managed quite well with the diagram. I shall allow this pantomime to continue only if the proceedings don't get out of hand, which they are in danger of doing. Thank you, my Lord. Please, it's important. Thank you. Now, Mr. Warren, can you tell us what happened in the boat? Well, I was aware that there was this other boat on the lake, but, and I wondered who else would be loony enough to be out in that kind of weather. But I didn't pay any particular attention until I saw the two women fighting, and him jumping up and down and shouting. Now, would you stand up, please? Now, you say they were fighting. Where were the defendant's hands? On the other one's shoulders. Mrs. Sellers, would you place your hands on her shoulders, please? And Valerie Sellers, where were her hands? I don't know. Um, everywhere. Trying to push the other woman away and trying to stay balanced. You may sit down now. And then? And then she went over the right side, backwards. I could tell she didn't know how to swim. How could you tell that? 
Well, she didn't try to get back into the boat or swim to shore. It was only 50 yards or so. She was just waving her arms. She was like, panicky. Did anyone in the boat try to help her? No, nobody did anything. They just looked. And what did you do? Well, I jumped in. And the people in the boat, the family, what did they do when they saw you jump in? Well, it was odd, that, because he seemed to be turning the boat away. And then it was like he changed his mind and decided to row in with us. Did they try to get the victim back in the boat? No, they just rowed in with us. And when you got her in? Well, she was in bad shape. We had to give her artificial respiration. Then the ambulance came and the police, and that's all. Thank you, Mr Warren. Uh, Mr Warren, you said there was some lightning. You think there. If any of these people are to be called during these proceedings, they must leave the court now. Oh, uh, as your lordship pleases. The passengers may disembark. Will the boat be required again? No. An usher? Please have it removed. Mr Warren, you said there was some lightning. Yes. <clears throat> when? Um. Mr Warren, what I'm trying to establish is this. Were you aware of the lightning before or after you saw the two women struggling in the boat? Oh, before, I believe. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it all seemed to be happening at once, the storm coming up and the two women struggling. The lightning flashed and, and, and then Valerie Sellers jumped up hysterical, terrified. Isn't that what you saw? Oh, I don't know about that. I put it to you that Mrs Sellers was in fact trying to restrain her daughter-in-law because she was hysterical. She was trying to stop Valerie Sellers from going over and from capsizing the boat. That's what you saw. Well, I can't say. It all happened very quickly. You can't say. Well, I understand that. In a crisis, people react without necessarily absorbing the event. You're clearly a careful and observant witness. Now, you said then she was in the water. Now, you didn't say that you actually saw Mrs Sellers push her daughter-in-law over the side. I think she pushed her. I think that's what happened. But you have some doubt as to what you saw. I know what I saw. But you're unsure of how to interpret what you saw. In, in a crisis situation, the most alert witness can have difficulty in placing the facts in order and therefore interpreting them. Now, Mr Warren, you said, I was due at practice at three. What sort of practice? Rowing. Are you in a team? Yeah, for the university. Now, to qualify for the rowing team, do, do you have to pass a swimming test? <laughs> yeah, of course you must. Uh, and life-saving? Have you had some instruction in, in water safety and life-saving? Yes. Do you know that some people are terrified of the water? You mean like a phobia? Precisely. An extreme fear of water. It's not that uncommon, is it? Oh, no. Some people are like that, yes. Well, what would the symptoms be? I mean, how, how, would, how would such people show that they were afraid? Well, same way as anybody shows afraid of anything. They stand up and scream. Yes, they stand up and scream and struggle and lash out at the person who's trying to save them. That's what happens, isn't it? But when you heard Valerie Sellers shout, let me go, I suggest that this was because she was hysterical. And, and trying to jump out of the boat, and that Mrs. Sellers was trying to restrain her. Well? Oh, yes, it's possible. Yes, it, it's possible. Now, just one thing further, Mr. Warren. Um, how high is the courtroom ceiling? Catch. Very good. My lord, having accused me of pyrotechnics, fireworks. My learned friend now asks the court to indulge her while she turns the court into a cricket pitch. My Lord, I apologise, but I, I think I have made my point, if I may be allowed to continue. Thank you, my Lord. Now, Mr Warren, you reacted very sharply. Your instincts are finely tuned. Now, why is it, do you suppose, that you can react so quickly? Well, it's not unusual for an athlete. An athlete? Yes, of course, you are a trained athlete. Now, would the average person be, be, be likely to react so quickly? Perhaps not. So, when you said nobody did anything, perhaps what you mean is that you jumped in before they did. What looked to you like inaction was really the time it takes the average person to react and absorb a, a crisis. I don't think so. Well, I know you don't, but the jury have seen for themselves the speed of your reaction. Yeah, but it didn't happen like that. So, I would suggest to you the following. Valerie Sellers has a fear of water. When the thunder and lightning began, she became hysterical and tried to jump out of the boat. Her husband's mother, sitting next to her, tried to stop her. The girl struggled and went over the side, trying to take her mother-in-law with her. 
Thank you, Mr. Warren. Any re-examination, Ms. Flannery? Just one question, my lord. Mr. Warren, on a day in June, when virtually no one was in the water because of inclement weather, can you imagine why Valerie Sellers' family should have taken her rowing? No. No, I truly can't imagine. I call Leonie Ryland. Call Leonie Ryland. Can you take the book in your right hand and read aloud the words on the card? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Are you Leonie Ryland of 12 Belvedere Close, Fulchester? Yes. And Valerie Sellers is your sister? Yes. Does your sister live with you? With me and my husband, yes. How long has your sister lived with you? For about six months. Since just before her mother-in-law tried to kill her. My lord. Yes, yes, I know. Since just before the incident. And why was she living with you rather than with her husband? She'd left him. How long had they been married? About four months. Was this the first time that she'd left him? Actually left him, yes. Had you any inkling that this might happen? And had there been any previous trouble? Yes. What trouble? I hardly know where to begin. He was thoroughly exploiting her, taking her money, seeing other women, and his mother was driving her crazy. Well, let's begin with the first, taking her money. Can you tell us what you know about that? Both our parents died ten years ago in a road accident. We each inherited £10,000 in a trust fund which we got at the age of 30. I'm now 35. When Valerie married Barry, she was 29, so she hadn't then inherited her money. Before they got married, Valerie asked me if she could borrow some money from me against her own trust fund. How much money? £800. Did you lend it to her? Yes. Do you know where that money went? Yes, to the accused, to buy some dry cleaning equipment. How do you know that? Well, I said I wouldn't lend her the money unless she agreed to let me see her bank statement every month. That may sound mean, but I felt, I still feel that Valerie needs taking care of. She's a very vulnerable girl, open and unsuspicious. Mrs. Ryland, did you yourself witness something which made you su suspect that Mr. Sellers and his mother did not have your sister's best interest at heart? Yes. One month before they were actually to be married, Barry Sellers asked me to have tea with him at his mother's flat. She was working downstairs in the dry cleaning shop and Valerie was at a class. What happened? He showed me a locket he'd bought for Valerie as a wedding present. He asked me if I thought she'd like it. I said, Yes, it's beautiful. And he said, and this is going to be very difficult for anyone to believe, he said, why don't you have it then? He was offering the locket to you? Yes. What was your, your reaction? Well, I was bewildered. I said, why are you offering this gift to me? It's meant to be for your wife. And he said, why don't you be my wife? So, this man who was to be married to your sister in one month was now asking you to marry him. That's right. It's difficult to credit, I know. What was your reaction? <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? You're marrying my sister next month, and I'm, I'm happily married myself. I've been for seven years. And he said, yes, I know. I didn't really fancy my chances. It was my mum's idea. The defendant wanted her son to marry you rather than your sister? Yes. We both had the same amount of money, you see. Except I had mine. Valerie had to wait a few months for hers. And his mother, the accused, felt that, I don't know, that I was more the sort of person her son ought to marry. And Mr. Sellers, what did he think? He thought so too. Though he didn't mind a lot one way or the other. He didn't really like women very much. Wasn't very interested. 
Oh, no. No, I don't mean he wasn't interested. He was very interested in what women could do for him. Barry pursued women like a career, like a job. What he wanted for a wife was someone suitable, with a bit of money to help out. And his mother thought that should be me instead of Valerie, and he agreed with her. And what about Valerie? How did he propose to explain it to her? Well, that was very strange. He said she'd live with us. We'd explain it to her, you see. And we'd all live together and all be friends and all take care of each other. Only I'd be his official wife instead of her. You say this was his mother's idea? That's what he said. And your husband? What was to be done about him? Barry said he could come and live with us too if he wanted. Do you mean like a commune? I don't know. I didn't stay to find out. I just said, I'm leaving now. And he said, OK, I'll stick with your sister then if you don't fancy it. But my mum thought you and I were a better combination. Did you tell your sister about this? No, not at the time. Not till she came to stay with us. When was that? You mean the date? The 8th of June. She phoned to say, could she come and stay? And I said, yes, of course. Less than an hour later, she arrived. Was she injured in any way? She had a black eye. What did she bring with her? One suitcase and the sewing. The sewing? Yes. The alterations. What do you mean, the alterations? That Mrs. Sellers had given her. Valerie was hysterical. She said, can you help me with the hems? The hems? That's right. Mrs. Sellers wanted Valerie to give up going to classes at the university and help out in the shop. She said she could make a lot of money doing alterations with Valerie's help. Oh, Valerie didn't want to do that. She liked going to the university and she hated sewing. She didn't know how. But Mrs. Sellers kept bringing her these alterations, you know, turning up hems and, and letting things out. And Well, anyway, when Valerie arrived, she said, can you help me with these? If I can help his mother, maybe he'll love me. Did you help her? With the hems? No. Even if I'd wanted to, I can't sew any better than she can. I gave her some tea and put her to bed, and we didn't really talk till the next day. What happened then? She told me how awful it had been the last few months, how they'd both ganged up on her. Mrs. Ryland, you've said that your sister had been staying with you for about two weeks before the incident. To your knowledge, during that time, did she see her husband at all? Yes, he came round several times. And then, on her birthday, June the 21st, they went on a picnic. That's when it happened. Oh, they planned it well in advance, of course. Barry and the old woman, and probably Cousin Nigel as well. They were all in on it. Well, Lord, I object. Mrs. Amy Sellers is the only one charged, and this court has been subjected to a great deal of immaterial evidence. Yes, I agree. Mrs. Ryland, would you please not give us your opinions regarding a conspiracy? But they all knew she was terrified of the water. Mrs. Ryland... So why take her boating as a birthday treat, for God's sake, in that weather? Mrs. Ryland, please. Mrs. Ryland, will you please confine yourself to answering questions put to you by learned counsel? I'm sorry. So, Mrs. Ryland, if we may just remind ourselves of the terms of your sister's trust fund. Your sister and you each inherited £10,000 on the death of your parents. The funds to be held in trust until you were 30. Did your sister have a will? Yes. Were you a witness to the will? Yes. Do you know who stood to benefit? Her husband, Barry Sellers. How old was your sister when she married, Mr. Sellers? 29. How old is she now? 30. When did she turn 30? June the 21st. The day of the incident? That's right. Thank you, Mrs. Ryland. Mrs. Ryland, there are some points in your evidence which I would like to clarify. Now, you told us about your meeting with Mr. Sellers one month before your sister married him. Was that the first time you'd met him? No. When was the first time? When she first introduced you to him? No. I thought this might come up. There was a time, about three years ago, when I was separated briefly from my husband. I went to a lecture at the university where I met Barry Sellers. We had a coffee together. Just one cup of coffee. Possibly two. Then I drove home alone. 
The following week, we went to the cinema. And then we went back to his flat and had tea with his mother. I again drove home alone. Two weeks later, I was back with my husband and we've been quite happy ever since. And that was the sum total of my relationship with Barry Sellers until the day he asked me to marry him. Did you ever tell your sister that you'd known him before? I didn't tell her any of it till she left him. Then I told her the entire story. What was her reaction? She took it very well. She said, I'm not really surprised. He sees lots of women. Now, you said in your evidence he was exploiting her. Did that mean he was taking her money and seeing other women? Yes. Now, the evidence you've given to support that is one loan to Mrs. Sellers of £800 and the meeting where you say that he suddenly suggested that you should marry him. Now, have you any other reasons for suspecting that he didn't love your sister? Valerie's shy and very quiet. She's... Well, I think she's very bright. She is very bright. Look, she's older than he is. The girls he liked had vitality. They were always very glossy. Like yourself? I was not one of his girls. Oh, I don't think you were. But I think you thought you were. You were having a very good time being a mother to your shy little sister. Mrs. Ryland, I put it to you that you were the one who suggested Mr. Sellers marry you instead of your sister, and that it was his mother who opposed it. No, that's not true. I suggest that you could not bear the idea of your shy little sister landing your catch. My catch? Barry Sellers? A part-time gigler and barely adequate student? No, thank you. He wasn't good enough for me. Or for my sister. Thank you. I now call Valerie Sellers. Call Valerie Sellers. The of the Queen against Amy Sellers continues today in the Crown Court. On the 24th of June, Amy Sellers went rowing with her son and his estranged wife, Valerie. The eyewitness who saved Valerie believes that he saw Amy Sellers push her daughter-in-law over the side of the boat. Amy Sellers has pleaded not guilty to the charge of attempted murder. You're Valerie Sellers, daughter-in-law of the accused? That's right. Will you tell us how and when you met your husband? A year and two months ago. That's 14 months. He was working in the cafeteria at the university. We went out, we saw each other for a while, and then we were married. So you were married four months? We're still married. Four months before the incident? Before she tried to kill me. Yes, four months. Was there some trouble between you during that time? Yes. On account of his mother, he just had a blind spot about her. You see, his father had died when he was very young and she worked to support him. And no matter how she behaved, he wouldn't take anyone's part against her. How did she behave? Well, she wanted me to give up my classes and help her in the shop. She said that Barry had a brilliant future as a professor and I wasn't doing anybody any good by studying. She wanted me to help her make more money so that Barry could give up his job in the cafeteria and only have to worry about his studies. Then she was on at me about a diary. She said that if my father had been alive, he would have given us some money, and that I should turn my trust fund over to Barry when I was 30. What was your reaction to that? Well, I wasn't about to do any of those things. I like studying, and I wasn't going to spend my days in her dry cleaning place. Well, when she saw I wasn't going to work in the shop, she started bringing home alterations. 
you know, hems and things for me to do in my spare time. But the thing is, you see, I can't sew. I tried, but it was so clumsy. I did a hem for her and it was hopeless. She showed it to Barry. She said, look at this. Look at this girl you've married. And she redid the hem herself. And then the following week, she brought home some more alterations. She said, I hope you can do a better job with these. And I said, I'll try. And I put them away in a cupboard. I didn't know what else to do. And was that when you left and moved in with your sister? Oh, no, I wouldn't have left just for that. Will you tell us what happened when you did leave? Well, she started bringing other women around for Barry. Your mother-in-law introduced her son to other women. She tried to. That was the idea. She started to, by just mentioning them, you know. And how did your husband react to that? Well, he just laughed or nodded. I don't think he listened to her half the time. And then one day she actually brought two of them round for tea. I came in from class and I wasn't even introduced. She started ordering me around, pretending I was the hired help. And Barry seemed to think it was funny. And the two girls were just giggling like mad. And when they left, she said to Barry, which one do you fancy? And he said, I'll have the one with the diamond and Val can have the one with the wooden leg. Not that either of them really had a wooden leg. He just thought it was funny. But I didn't. I, I can understand that. Well, I went into the bedroom and I slammed the door. And Barry came in and said, what's wrong? You can't have taken that seriously. And before I could answer, she marched in and said, where are the alterations? And I said, what alterations? And she said, the ones I gave you two weeks ago. My customers are waiting. And I said, you want the alterations? I'll show you the alterations. And I opened the cupboard door and started pulling them out and throwing them around. And she went mad and Barry took her side. He said I should have said if I wasn't going to do them, now she'd probably lose her customers. And then she punched me. So the black eye that your sister mentioned... She did it. She looks frail, but she's quite fit, really. What happened after she hit you? Well, I rang my sister and then I left. And what happened when you went to your sister's? Well, the first night she gave me some tranquilizers and all I did was sleep. And then the following day, Leone told me how she'd known Barry before. And that a month before we were married, he'd said that he wanted to marry her instead because his mother thought it would be better. Were you upset? Well, not really. By that time, I'd realized how crazy the whole thing was and I just wanted to get out. But you continue to see your husband? Yes. Well, he was all right away from her. He's quite a good person, really, on his own. But why did you agree to spend your birthday with him and his mother? He begged me. He said she wanted to have a picnic, Barry and me and Barry's cousin Nigel. Will you tell us what happened on that day? Yes. I had the car and I met them at the park at about one. I'd never seen her so pleasant, not ever. You mean the defendant? Yes. She was really on best behavior. She'd done a whole spread, baked a cake. She was quiet and friendly, like a normal person. I couldn't believe it. How long did the picnic last? About an hour. And then the weather became so threatening. I said, thank you for a lovely lunch, but I thought I'd like to leave. And she said, the accused said, you can't go now, we're going rowing. I booked the boat. Booked the boat, she said, as if it were Henley and everyone were queuing up for the pleasure. What did you say? I said, that's very thoughtful of you, but I don't think it's rowing weather, and I don't like the water. Uh, were those your exact words, and I don't like the water? <coughs> and you know I don't like the water. That's what I said. So, why did you go in the boat? Oh, for the same reason I tried to sew her hems and waited on other women at table. For Barry. He said the weather would hold for half an hour, that we'd just go up and down the lake, and if I felt worried when we were out there, we'd come right back in. Did you feel worried? Well, no more than usual. But then the storm came up, and Barry said, right, we'll go back in. And she said, do some tricks for us, Nigel. And Barry's cousin, Nigel, started jumping around, tipping the boat back and forth. Barry told him to stop it, but she just laughed. I think she was singing come kind of... I think she was singing some kind of rowing song. It was terrible. The boat was really going like that. And then I was sitting down, trying to hang on, and she pulled me up and started pushing me over the side. And I said, 
let me go, what are you doing? But she just kept pushing me and then I was in the water. And that's the last thing I remember until I came round in hospital. She looks as if butter wouldn't melt in her mouth, I know. But she really did try to kill me. Thank you, Mrs. Sellers. Mrs. Sellers, the prosecution has made much of your saying to the defendant, you know, I don't like the water. Are you frightened of the water? Oh, yes, desperately. You I say always have been. You say your mother-in-law knew of this? Everybody knows it. How? What do you mean? Well, how did your mother-in-law or anyone else know that you were afraid of the water? Had there been an incident on the water before? No. Had you discussed it before? Not with her. Well, how would she know? Barry would have told her. He told her everything. And yet he is prepared to swear that he did not know until that day that you were afraid of the water. Well, she knew. Well, how did she know? She knew. I'm not going to lie to prove it. It doesn't matter. She pushed me over. So you've told us. Now, can we just go over all that part again? You said Nigel was clowning around, the lightning struck, and then the defendant pulled you up. That's right. How did she pull you up? By the wrists. <laughs> well, it seems to me that would have been very difficult for her. I mean, she's not a very large or a very young woman. She'd have to stand up to pull you up. Were you struggling to get away? Of course I was. Well, in order to, to pull you up and push you over, she'd have had to stand in a boat that was being swayed both by rough weather and Cousin Nigel. She'd have had to have kept her balance and overpowered you as you struggled. By the way, you, did she say anything? She said, don't be such a stupid cow, calm down. Calm down? Are those the words you'd expect someone to use who was trying to push someone else over the side? Yes, those are exactly the words she'd use if she wanted Barry to think it was an accident. I never said she was slow-witted, did I? And besides, she had it all planned. Oh, you think she knew the weather would be bad on your birthday? I think she hoped it would be. I mean, there was a fair chance this summer. And if she hadn't done it then, she would have done it another time, maybe another way. She wanted the money and she wanted Barry to herself. How did she know about your money? She knew about it. The same way she knew about your aquaphobia. I have to suggest, Mrs. Sellers, that when the storm came up suddenly and Mr. Holt started to rock the boat, you became hysterical and that when the defendant tried to restrain you, you struggled away and fell over the side or even jumped overboard. No. After it was over, you saw the chance of turning it against your mother-in-law. No. Mrs. Sellers. Mrs. Sellers, if your husband's mother actually is convicted of trying to drown you, what do you think will happen? She'll go to prison, won't she? And if that happens, where will your husband go? Back to the flat. And you? Well, I'd go back with him until we could find a new place to live. So with your mother-in-law out of the way, you and he could go back together and be happy? Well, once he saw how really bad she was, yes. Why not? Thank you, Mrs. Sellers. No more questions. Wallace. Yes. You know the accused? Yes. What is your relationship with her? Was. I was going to marry her son. When was this? About two years ago. What happened? We didn't get married. Why not? I didn't get on with his mother. In what way? In no way. Can you tell us the major conflicts between you? I suppose the major conflict was over money. She actually wanted a premarital agreement, a dowry she called it, where I settled some money on Barry. <laughs> I didn't really see why I should do that. How did she approach you about this? Well, after we told her we were getting married, she said she was thrilled about it. About two days later, she took me to lunch, the daffodil room in Burridge's department store. And then she said, what about the financial arrangements? Financial arrangements? Well, that's what I said. What financial arrangements? And she said, well, how are you and Barry going to live? And I said that I had a small trust fund, and that, plus Barry's job, could see us through until he graduated. Well, after that, I assumed that he'd get a fairly decent job, after all that studying. And then she started telling me about all the lovely girls whom Barry knew, and how fortunate I was that he'd chosen me. And then she said that he had a brilliant future, and that she hated to see him working away, exhausting himself, slaving away in the cafeteria. And that didn't I have some special wedding present in mind? I said, yes, 
I'd seen some lovely cufflinks in the shape of Rupert Bear. She didn't think much of that as a gift. And then she came right out and said, you ought to give him £5,000, then he wouldn't have to work and worry so much. And your reaction to that? Well, I just thought, what am I getting into? The next day I broke off the engagement. Because of his mother? Partly. But also I think I realised that I'd been a bit impulsive. I tried to imagine myself living in a three-room flat with Barry and his mother, above a dry cleaning shop. But I think I realised that we weren't terribly well suited. I was very young. And how did Mr. Sellers take it when you broke it off with him? Well, he blamed his mother for everything. He said he'd talk to her and sort it all out. And I said that even if he did, I didn't think we really belonged together. Anyway, a few days later, he rang me and said, would I please, please go and see his mother in the shop? as she blamed herself and wanted to apologise and talk to me. So I did. I went round, and as soon as I walked into the shop, she started screaming the most incredible obscenities at me. I mean, a woman her age, it was extraordinary. And then she was ironing. She, um, she held the iron against my arm. She burned me. Was it a serious burn? Well, left a scar. Is your arm still scarred? Well, you can still see it. Well, not very much. It was two years ago. Miss Wallace, did you see Mr. Sellers again after that? We never went out together again. I bumped into him a few months later. He was with a girl I'd known at school. After that, I heard that he was marrying someone else. Thank you, Miss Wallace. Miss Wallace, why did Mrs. Sellers burn your arm? Because she's a nutter, daft as a brush, and she needs putting away. What was Mrs. Sellers doing when you came into the shop? I told you, she was ironing. What was she ironing? Good heavens, I haven't a clue. Wasn't it a green silk dress worth £150? I doubt if anything that expensive ever came into that shop. I suggest it did. I also suggest that there was a tea tray at the back of the shop. Do you remember that? Not especially. There was usually a pot of tea going. Yes, indeed. A pot of tea, some scones and some strawberry jam. Some nice, thick strawberry jam. And I suggest to you, during your course with, of your row with Mrs. Sellers, when she accused you of being shallow, fickle, stupid, and not worthy of the attentions of her son, you dipped your fingers into that strawberry jam and you smeared it all over the green silk dress worth 150 pounds. And when Mrs. Sellers put that arm iron down on your arm, she did it out of sheer panic in order to prevent you from destroying both the dress and her livelihood. Codswallop, that never happened. She's a nasty, violent old cow. And I hope they put you away for 200 years, you rabbit-faced old biddy! Kindly refrain from this disorderly behaviour, Miss... Uh, Wallace. Most terribly sorry. <clears throat> Is there anything else? After your arm was burned, where did you go? Must have needed treatment. Did you go to a hospital? Yeah, I managed to drive to my own doctor. I see. And what did the police do? The police weren't involved. Well, if this was a case of malicious wounding, surely it was the duty of the doctor to inform the police. I, um, I didn't tell him. I just told him it was an accident. A woman attacks you with a hot iron and you say it was an accident? Well, I just wanted to get away and not see them anymore. I felt I was into something I didn't understand. I just... I just wanted to get away. From your feelings? From theirs. Well, Mrs. Sinclair, have you any further questions for the witness? No. No, my lord. Miss Flannery? That is the case of the prosecution, my lord. Oh. The last witness has alleged that your mother attacked her with an iron. Is that what happened? Well, my mother was provoked. Well, will you tell us when you arrived on the scene? But now later, I suppose. Her mum was crying. It took some time to calm her down. And then she said, I burned her. I burned her with the iron. She could have me arrested. Then she told me what had happened and showed me the dress. Had great smears of strawberry jam across it. I just couldn't believe it. Did you see Caroline Wallace after that? No, she rang a few times, but I didn't want to know any more. I mean, I'd been fascinated by her, but she was too neurotic. I, I just couldn't cope with it. Now, the day when Miss Wallace went to see your mother, had you asked her to do that? No. I had no idea she was going to turn up. Neither had my mother. We'd broken off, you see. Oh, could you describe that? I mean, how you broke off? 
Well, I realised I was just out of my depth, socially, financially. I mean, how was a girl like that going to come and live with me and my mother? Anyway, I told her as far as I knew it was finished until she turned up at the shop that day. In other words, you broke off with Miss Wallace? That's right. How did she react? Well, she was none too pleased. She said I was silly to worry about money and that she had enough for both of us and she'd buy us a house. And she said that as a wedding present, she'd give me £5,000 of my own and I could do what I liked with it. So it wouldn't be like I was coming to her for money. I said I just couldn't do that and, I don't know, she seemed to think it was all to do with my mother. Anyway, as far as I knew, that was the end of it until she turned up at the shop. Now, Mr Sellers, when your wife left you and then you got together for the picnic, whose idea was that? Oh, that was entirely different. That was my mother's idea. She knew she'd been difficult and she wanted to make it up. Was she sorry? Well, she was worried that I might go off and leave her on her own. I mean, I'd put up with a lot from her because, well, people put up with things from their mothers. Anyway, I did, but for Valerie, that was too much. I mean, I loved Valerie and my mother forced her out. And she knew she'd better help get her back. Now, Mr Sellers, can you describe for us what happened just before you went into the boat? Yes, uh, I must get it right. At about two, the sky clouded over and Valerie said, thank you for a lovely picnic, but I think I should be going. Well, of course, that upset my mother because she told me she'd get Valerie to come back to the flat with us. She said she'd... Uh, so she tried to get her to stay. She said she'd got this boat booked and Valerie said, well, it's not really boating weather, but as long as the boat was booked, she'd chance it. And did she say, you know I don't like the water? I didn't hear her say that. Had you known previously that she had a, a phobia about water? No. Or did your mother know? Well, if she did, I don't know how she found out. So, would you say then, Mr Sellers, that your wife went quite happily, no, no, I'll amend that, quite willingly into the boat? No, well, we certainly didn't drag her. She never said she was afraid. Now, how long would you say you were in the boat before the difficulty arose? I'd say ten minutes. What happened during that time? Well, it was fun. Everybody was singing. And what was the first sign of any difficulty? Well, Nigel started being silly, standing up and rocking the boat in rhythm with the song. Then there was thunder and lightning, pouring rain. It all seemed terribly sudden. I turned around and saw Valerie trying to get out of the boat and my mother trying to restrain her. And Valerie was saying, let me go. And Nigel still seemed to be rocking the boat as if he hadn't caught up with what was happening. Then I saw this man in the water trying to help her and she was completely panicky, struggling and trying to get him under. I was afraid I might hit them with an oar, so I took about three strokes out, then turned the boat round and headed in again. So, when Mr Warren testified that you seemed to be rowing away from the victim, you were in fact trying to avoid hitting her. That's right. Then we gave her artificial respiration and the ambulance came. When I got to the hospital, they wouldn't let me see her. The doctor had left instructions that nobody but her sister could see her. A couple of nights later, the police came round and charged my mother. I just couldn't believe it. I don't know what Val told the police, but... I think her sister must have gotten to her. And what was your mother's reaction to all this? Well, what's anybody's reaction when they're accused of a crime they didn't do? She's frightened. She's very frightened. Thank you, Mr Sellers. <coughs> Mr Sellers, you've testified that Caroline Wallace offered you the sum of £5,000. She says that your mother demanded it from her as a wedding gift. Caroline offered me the money when I told her I wanted to break off with her. She says it was she who broke off the engagement. Well, that isn't the way I remember it. It was, of course, some time ago. Well, not that long. Have you had quite a few female friends, Mr Sellers? Well, how many is quite a few? Did you ever have a girlfriend who had less money than you? My lord, this is a most irrelevant and improper question. Yes, I quite agree. And, Miss Flannery, I think you know it too. As your lordship pleases, I withdraw the question. About the dress, Mr Sellers. You say you actually saw it smeared with jam? Yes, that's right. I remember it well. You've also said that about an hour elapsed between the time that Miss Wallace ran from the shop and you arrived to find your mother in tears. Did it occur to you that your mother might have smeared the dress with jam herself? No, it didn't occur to me. Is it possible? I don't think so. I know you don't think so. Is it physically possible? Oh, yes, I suppose so. Thank you. Mr. Sellers, your wife has told us that your mother brought other girls round to meet you when your wife was living there. Is this true? There was nothing in it. But did it happen? Once. 
Your wife has also told the court that when she came in, she was treated like a servant, and that you went along with that. Is that what happened? My Lord, the prosecution is repeatedly attacking this witness who is not on trial and is not charged with any crime. The elements of the allegation are based on the relationship between Mr. Sellers, his mother and his wife. I feel the incident is relevant. In this particular case, I'm inclined to hear any evidence that may help enlighten us. Please continue, Ms. Flannery. Thank you, my Lord. Do you remember the question, Mr. Sellers? Yes, I did behave the way she said I did. I felt angry at her. At your wife? Yes, it was irritating. She loved the whole Cinderella thing. She thrived on it, and she never wanted to get to the ball. I wanted her to show some spirit, talk back, yell, scream, do something. You admit that your mother mistreated Valerie? Well, of course she did. My mother was impossible. She tried to wreck every relationship I ever had. She is possessive and she is eccentric, but all that's a very long way from attempted murder. Now, your sister-in-law has told the court that Mrs. Sellers turned up at our house with a black eye. Oh, yes. Can you tell us how it happened? Well, I'm afraid I did it. Your wife has said that your mother did it. My mother? No. It was an accident, but I did it. It was the same afternoon as the tea party. Val and my mother finally had a two-way fight. She was supposed to be helping with some alterations, and when my mother asked to see them, she went spare. Started pulling them out of the cupboard and throwing them around. There was a coat on a large hanger, and I was trying to get it away from her, and the hanger hit her on the cheek. Of course, I was sorry, but she rang her sister and left. This whole story is probably Val's way of getting back at us. You think she lied to the police? I don't know. Maybe she thought it happened. She's very panicky and not very stable to begin with. Mr. Sellers, your life seems plagued by wealthy and unstable women. Well, that may be true. But it does not follow that my mother tried to drown my wife. of the Queen against Amy Sellers continues today in the Crown Court. Amy Sellers is accused of attempting to drown her daughter-in-law, Valerie. The court has heard that Mrs. Sellers had a history of violence and that she disliked her daughter-in-law. Today, the jury reaches its verdict. She's doing an awfully good job, just sitting there looking frail. She'll be just as good on the stand. Mm. She could be a rather unpredictable witness. Well, look, unless she confesses to a couple of axe murders, I don't see how it can go wrong. Hmm. What worries me is Cousin Nigel. Mm. Well, you have to produce him. He's an eyewitness. Mm. Yes. I suppose we ought to say hello. Yes. Now that we've both testified, you said about coming home, you said if they hauled Mum off to prison, that you thought the two of us would just go back together? That's what I said. Were you serious? As a matter of fact, I wasn't. I thought it made me look more sympathetic. Oh, I know she treated you badly. I did too. You were all right. But you're going too far. You can't destroy the woman just because she didn't like you. She tried to kill me. She planned it. She yanked me up and pushed me over. What if you're wrong? I mean, just suppose that somehow you're mistaken and she was trying to help you. Your back was turned. You didn't see it. Well, I heard her yell, calm down. She meant you to hear that. Look, what if she didn't do it and she goes to prison? What if she did do it and she goes free? Mrs. Sellers, will you tell us how you felt when your son told you he was going to marry Valerie Sellers? Well, I must be honest. I felt my son could do better. I didn't think she was as bright as he is. And I felt that Barry should be with a very bright woman. Now, did you in any way try to stop him? What, Barry? Try to stop him when he'd set his mind to something. He must be joking. It was not that I could do, but hope for the best. 
Now, did you encourage your daughter-in-law to stop studying and to help you in the shop? Oh, that, as I recall, was Barry's idea. About uh, six weeks after they were married, we were having our tea, the three of us, and Valley said, you know, I'm not all that interested in my classes anymore, and I'm not doing very well, which is true enough, Lord knows. Ask her how many O-levels she's got. Anyway, Barry said, well, why don't you leave and help Mum in the shop? You might like it. Well, she said she'd think about it. Well, I was a bit relieved, but to be honest, for one, she was a bit cack-handed, and for two, well, we didn't really have much to say to each other. Now, what about the alterations, the, the diabolical hems we've heard so much about? Yes, well, she wanted to be more help. She would cook the odd meal. She could do a perfectly nice leg of lamb. Though I did think that if she'd been a better cook, she could have used less expensive cuts. Still, she said that she felt guilty with me working so hard and she was waltzing around at the university. So I said, would she like to help me with some hems? Like just shortening things, you understand. Not taking them in or letting them out. Well, she said that she wasn't any good with a needle, but she'd like to try. So I gave her a few things. So, and, well, they were so sloppy, I had to do them all again. Then, a few weeks later, I think she was upset about something, maybe something between her and Barry, I don't know. But she came to me in something of a state, and she said, could she try some more hems? Said she'd be careful. Well, I didn't really want to give her any more, but she needed humouring, so I did. Well, one week went by, and then two. I asked her about them. Well, she went mad. She pulled them out of the cupboard and started throwing them around, and then the doorbell rang, and it was two young girls that I'd invited round for tea. I'm sorry, the, the incident with the hems, did that happen before the tea? Well, part of it before and part of it after. Well, your daughter-in-law says she came in from a class and found you and your son having tea with two girls. No, she's confused. She was throwing the things around and Barry came running when he heard her shouting and then the doorbell rang and I said, that'll be the two young ladies. And Valerie said, well, I'm not coming out. She slammed the door. Well, she did come out just as we were beginning to enjoy ourselves. And she didn't half look aside. She'd hit herself on the cheek with a clothes hanger when she was carrying on and it was beginning to bruise. You didn't give her the black eye? No. And your son didn't? No, don't think so. She did it to herself. I see. Well, what happened when she joined you? Oh, well, by that time I really was cross. I mean, all that bother about the alterations and then her appearing like that in front of my guests. I refused to introduce her. I just asked her to bring things in and take them out, as if she were the maid. Well, she cooperated. She brought the tea things in, did as she was told, as if she was in a trance. Afterwards, I heard her yelling at Barry, why do you let her treat me that way? And he yelled back, he said, why do you let her treat you that way? Why are you so blank, blank wet? The blank blanks are words that the jury might not like to hear. Well, I didn't think I behaved all that badly, but she upped and left. Now, how did you feel about her leaving? Well, I must be honest, I felt it was a good riddance. I mean, she and Barry weren't getting on, but he was terribly upset. So, well, I promised that when a day or two, when she'd calmed down a bit, I'd apologise. Now, when was the next time you saw her? That Saturday, her birthday. Now, Mrs Sellers. Did you know she had a trust fund that matured on that day? No. No, I only found that out when I was charged. Now, did you know that your son was a beneficiary under her will? No. There wasn't any way I could have known that. Now, Mrs Sellers, will you tell us as carefully as you can what happened on the day of the accident? Yeah. Well, you see, I promised Barry that I'd help him to bring her back. And when he told me that that day was her birthday, I said, right, we'll have a picnic. It takes the open air to clear the air. So uh, I bought a nice lunch and uh, I made a cake. And 
Ballet was a bit shy at first, but when she saw there wasn't going to be any trouble with me, she relaxed. Had a drop of wine. Oh, did she? How much wine would you say? Oh, well, it's difficult to say. I didn't care for it. It was too dry for me, so I just had a sip, and the other three finished the bottle between them. I, d I don't know how much she had. She did seem a bit flushed. But not staggering, you understand, just happy like. I see. <clears throat> what happened next? Well, I'd booked a rowing boat because I thought that would be nice. But the sky had become quite overcast, so I said, well, I booked a rowing boat, but it's not really rowing weather. You said that? You were the one who said it's not really rowing weather? That's right. Please continue. Well, after I'd said it's not really rowing <laughs> weather, Valerie said, no, it's not rowing weather. But as you've booked the boat, why don't we take a chance? Well, the afternoon was going such a treat. I didn't want to spoil it, so I said, yes, come on, let's go out there. Perhaps the weather will hold. And that's what happened. Now, when you got out onto the lake... Well, Barry was rowing, and we were all singing, row, row, row your boat. I did think that Barry looked a little shaky. I thought perhaps it was the wine. And then the sky clouded over very quickly, and a storm came up, lightning and thunder. Well, Barry turned the boat towards the shore. And the next thing, well, Valerie was standing up and shouting, I'm getting out of here. Well, I stood up and I grabbed hold of her and I said, where do you think you're going, you daft thing? And she started screaming, let me go, let me go. She tried to push me over the side of the boat. Lord, Valerie Sellers is not charged. We are aware of that, but my client must be permitted to tell the events as they happen to her. Yes, I think she must. Thank you, my lord. So, Mrs Sellers, your daughter-in-law was struggling with you? Yes. Well, first of all, she was pulling away, and then she started pushing me. And I lost my balance for a moment. I suppose me losing my balance caused her to lose hers. Perhaps that's why the young man said I pushed her. Anyway, she went over, and the young man jumped right in and brought her back to the shore. When I tried to get blankets and hot coffee, because I thought that was the right thing to do, and then the ambulance came. And then two nights later, the police came and said I tried to kill her. I just couldn't understand why. I couldn't think what she told them. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but God will punish you, that's definite. That's all, Mrs. Sellers. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> oh, Mrs. Sellers, just a minute. Oh, is there more? Yes, the uh, prosecuting counsel may like to ask you some questions. Oh, oh, yes, the other lady, of course. I won't keep you long, Mrs. Sellers. Just one or two things I'd like to get straight. Do you know your son's sister-in-law, Leonie Ryland? I used to know her. When did you meet her? Oh, about three years ago. My son brought her round once or twice. Well, once, I think. Mrs Ryland has said that you wanted your son to marry her. Well, I did think she was the more suitable of the two. She was older, but she had more spirit. Barry likes a girl with spirit. She was also married. Did you suggest that she divorce her husband? Well, they obviously weren't getting on. She wouldn't have been out with Barry. But that was three years ago. She was back with her husband when your son decided to marry her sister. Yes, well, I thought we might all live together if she still wanted her husband around. But I, I thought she'd be better for Barry than her sister. Oh, you thought you could all live together in a sort of uh, collective? Oh, well, I don't know if I really thought that. I like to think of myself as a as an advanced sort of person. You know, I'd done some reading, you know, about where society was headed and nuclear families and that. Well, it didn't seem such a bad idea. And what would the financial arrangements have been? Oh, well, I don't know. That was Leonie's trust fund. Oh, you knew about her trust fund? Yes. But not about her sisters. You've said you didn't know about your daughter-in-law's trust fund. No, I didn't. Now, your daughter-in-law has told the court that you asked her to turn her trust over to Barry. Can you explain that? Yes, I can. She was lying. 
People do lie, you know, even under oath. You know, I could pretend that I didn't care about the money and appear more virtuous. But it did matter to me because of Barry. I worked hard for it all my life so that he could get on with his studies and have the career that he deserved. I wanted my Barry to have the best looking, most intelligent, richest girl he could find. Well, let these good people decide if that makes me the sort of woman that would kill her son's wife. Yes, we will, but we've wandered from the track, Mrs. Sellers. Now, the two young ladies whom you invited to tea with your son, who were they? Oh, I don't know. They were just two pleasant girls that came into the shop, very lively and friendly. I wondered if you knew that they were prostitutes. Were they? Well, I mean, you can't tell nowadays, can you? Everybody has their clothes dry cleaned. No, I didn't know. I certainly did not know. I suggest that you did. I suggest that in bringing prostitutes home to meet your son, you deliberately intended to humiliate his wife. I also suggest to you, Mrs. Sellers, that you got considerable pleasure from the scene which you created. My Lord, this harangue is both tasteless and immaterial. Yes, I agree. I shouldn't like to see it go very much further, Miss Flannery. No further questions for the accused. <laughs> Mr. Holt, you were facing the two women the whole time. You saw everything that happened. Yes. I suppose Valerie were really scared, like, you know. She was standing up screaming, let me go. I mean, we were trying to calm her down, you know. They were pulling at each other. And then, the, then they were standing apart, like, trying to stay balanced. And then Valerie sort of came at her like that, you know. You mean Valerie Sellers was pushing the defendant? She looked like she either meant to push her or to get past her. Anyway, me aunt sort of moved to the left, like, you know, duck like. And Valerie pitched over its side. Oh, it was terrible, you know. I mean, we were all sort of confused. I mean, I could see a splash in there, like, but I couldn't believe it were happening, you know. It seemed so unlikely. And then this, this bloke were in the water with her, like, trying to get her back to shore. And I tell you, it's a good job he were a strong swimmer. Because our Val were doing the best to check him under. Anyway... Then we got to the shore, like, and uh, Barry and this other fella were giving a kiss of life, like, and I dialed 999. Is there anything else you want to know? I only want to ask you, Mr. Holt, did it at any time, in any way, appear to you or occur to you that Mrs. Sellers was trying to drown her daughter-in-law? No, no, it never did. Thank you. Mr. Holt, how did the matter of the boat come up? Well, my aunt said, I've booked a rowing boat, but it isn't really rowing weather. And what did Valerie Seller say? She said, no, it isn't really rowing weather. And anyway, you know I don't like the water. She said, you know I don't like the water. You heard Valerie Seller say that? Yes. Why is that important? Well, both Barry Sellers and Amy Sellers have said that they didn't know that she was afraid of the water. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they didn't hear. Properly like, you know. Anyway, she didn't say she was afraid. She said she didn't like it. Yes, all right. What happened next? We went rowing. Was Valerie persuaded to get in the boat? I don't think so. But did she need persuading? Nobody forced her. Now, you were in the boat, facing the two women, and everyone was singing. You were standing up, rocking the boat. Why were you behaving that way, in a boat, during a storm? Suppose I'd had too much to drink, like. And she said, come on, Nigel, let's have some of your tricks. The accused version of that is, come on, Nigel, let's have none of your tricks. Is that what you were saying? That's what she said she was saying. Oh, well, that must be right. 
I couldn't have heard her properly. I mean, why should she encourage me to rock the boat? Only to make sure that her daughter-in-law was as frightened and as much off her guard as possible. Oh, no, no, that's rubbish. Now, the accident itself. Stop me if I'm wrong. You said they were pulling at each other, and then they were apart, each trying to stay balanced, and then Valerie came at her. My aunt sort of moved to the left, you know, ducked, and Valerie pitched over the side. Is that right? Is that the way you remember it? Yes, that's it. You mean she fell past Mrs. Sellers pitching forward over the left side of the boat? Yes. But she didn't. Everyone else, including the accused, has said that Valerie Sellers fell backwards over the right side of the boat. Did she? Oh, I thought she went forwards. I mean, it's difficult to take it in like at the time, you know. Yes, it is. We all understand that. I don't mean to confuse you, Mr. Holt. And I know my colleague will object if I seem to be badgering you. But there's something else you said. You said, when you saw her splashing around in the water, I wasn't sure it was happening. It seemed so unlikely. What seemed unlikely? That she'd have fallen from the boat. Why did it seem unlikely? Surely people have fallen out of boats before. Oh, yes, of course they have. So did she. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, it was only a little lake. More of a pond light, really. And I mean, even with the storm, it was still quite still. I mean, I know I were playing about rocking the boat backwards and forwards. But I mean, a rowing boat is a steady little craft, you know. It's difficult to fall out of a rowing boat. Exactly, Mr. Holt. No. No, no, I mean, that shows you how hysterical she was, you see. I mean, she was standing there screaming, let me go. And she got away from me, and she jumped out of the boat. Jumped out of the boat? Yes. Backwards? I still think it were forwards. I see. Yes. Now, Mr Holt, we haven't really established your relationship to the accused. Well, she's my aunt. I'm her nephew. Is she your mother's sister, then? No. My father was her brother. So my mother was her sister-in-law. Are they deceased? Well, they're dead like. How long have they been dead? My father for about five years. My mother for three. When your mother was alive, did she see much of the accused? No, no. They met once after my father had died and never again after that. My lord, this evidence is complicated enough without introducing a relationship that cannot possibly be relevant to the child. I hope to provide information concerning the character of the accused, which is very much related to the charge. Very well, Miss Flannery. Mr Holt, why did your mother not see her sister-in-law for so many years? Well, my mother wasn't very well like in the later part of her life. She imagined some very strange things. She thought my aunt was trying to kill her. Did your mother on one occasion summon the police? Yes. Why was that? She said Aunt Amy had attacked her with a bread knife. Thank you, Mr Holt. Well, re-examination, Mrs Clinker. Yes, please, my lord. <laughs> Mr Holt, what did your mother die of? Brain tumour. Where did she die? From Chester Mental Hospital. Did she think anyone else was trying to kill her? Yes. The man from the electricity board. And me towards the end. Now, why was she put in a mental hospital? Well, the day she ran out of the house screaming for police, like, she found a policeman and he came back to the house with her. And she said Aunt Jamie had tried to stab her with bread knife. So a policeman had come back with her, see. And Aunt Jamie was there. Only she was the one who had a great gash across her arm. The one to mark on my mother. Thank you, Mr Holt. That is the case for the defence. Will the foreman please stand? Please answer this question, yes or no. Are you all agreed upon your verdict? Yes. On the charge of attempted murder, do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty? 
not guilty. Is that the verdict of you all? It is. Mrs. Sellers, the jury has found you not guilty of the charge. At the end of the prosecution evidence, I was in two minds as to whether there was sufficient of a case to, to answer. However, I thought it only right that the trial should continue, the jury should decide the matter. I must say I'm rather surprised the case was ever brought. We're now free to go. Mum, you didn't push her over, did you? No, I don't think so. I certainly hadn't planned to. No, I'm sure I didn't. Oh. 